Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the forum for this evening's uh, Gustav Pollock lecture. Uh, let me start, first of all, by welcoming all of you and thanking you for coming for a really very important and exciting event for us. Let me also uh, thank you for coming, especially if you're willing to turn off your cell phone or at least set it to vibrate uh, the, so that we can have the opportunity to fully enjoy uh, Paul Farmer's uh, talk. I should say that the uh, Gustav Pollock Lectureship was founded uh, back in 1951, so it's uh, one of the very important ones for us, by Leo Silver, uh, as a memorial to journalist Gustav Pollock, who wrote for The Nation uh, and other publications in the 20th century. And it's very much in that spirit that we have someone who has uh, written a great deal, but done a great deal more uh, in Paul Farmer this evening. Now, we always start these with a bit of biography. And uh, this time, uh, I'm able to actually quote some biography uh, from Paul. So let me just quote it. He said, I'd like to be able to say that when I was young, I lived in a trailer park, picked fruit with Haitians, got interested in migrant farm workers, and went to Latin America. All true, but not the truth. Yeah. Um, we're asked to have tidy biographies but that are coherent. Everyone does that. But the fact is, a perfectly discrepant version uh, the fact is, a perfectly discrepant version has the same ending. Okay, so this is perplexing. Um, I should give you some insight uh, into the man who sits before you, um, but I'll have to fill in the gaps to keep me honest about the facts of his story. He's a medical anthropologist and a physician, uh, and he's dedicated his life to treating some of the world's poorest populations. He is the kind of person that I think is an inspiration to all of us. Uh, he is the sort of person that makes remarkable medical uh, successes, and he's also the kind of person who appears on parade magazines on Sunday, which he was <laughs> this last Sunday. Um, he, in so doing, he has helped to raise the standard of healthcare in learn to develop areas around the world. Now, as a child, he actually did pick fruit, and he really did live in a trailer. Uh, experiences, among others, provided by a father in the name of adventure. Um, and when Tracy Kidder, the author of Dr. Farmer's biography, Mountains Beyond Mountains, suggested to Mrs. Farmer, that the farmer kids were far from couch potatoes, she said, no couch. <laughs> <laughs> so from this adventurous childhood, uh, Dr. Farmer went on to earn his bachelor's degree at Duke and his MD and, and a simultaneous PhD in, in anthropology from Harvard University. Now think of it, it's an MD and a, a PhD in anthropology. It's a really lovely combination. It misses only, of course, a some sort of public policy degree, but we'll <laughs> keep working on that. Um, and, in the, and I think, much can be understood from that because in the early 1980s he began splitting his time between Boston and Haiti and uh, where he learned a lot about the practical application of his education and the vast uh, sociological, the economic, and the technological differences between two nations. And indeed from this experience in 1985 he co-founded uh, Sanmi Lasante, did I get that, that badly? Uh, Creole for Partners in Health, which is in fact the name of the organization now in English that is also, uh, he co-founded it two years later in Boston. Uh, he developed a hospital, which grew from a one-building clinic in the village of Kanj uh, to a multi-service health complex uh, that continues to thrive under his directorship. Um, and uh, Paul is the kind of person that establishes these kind of long-term serious relationships um, with sister organizations around the world, uh, particularly in settings of uh, poverty and often in settings of great conflict. Um, it strives to achieve two overarching goals, Partners in Health does, to bring the benefits of modern medical science to those who need them and to serve as an antidote to despair. Uh, it's hard to imagine a uh, richer and more uh, important message for all of us. Uh, he's worked in infectious disease control in the Americas for over two decades. He's a world-renowned authority on tuberculosis treatment and control. Uh, he also trains medical residents uh, and medical students at Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. He's currently chief of division of social medicine and a uh, division of social medicine and health inequalities. Um, it probably goes without saying that someone with such remarkable achievements around the world would get numerous awards, but he really has gotten numerous awards. A Duke University Humanitarian Award, the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association, American Medical Association's International Physician Award. He's also the winner of a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Genius Award and the Heinz Award for, human condition, for the human condition. Um, Dr. Farmer really is the embodiment of what many of us uh, only dream we could be. 
As Teresa Hines, the chairperson of the Hines Family Foundation stated, to say that Dr. Paul Farmer is a lifesaver does not begin to describe the impact of his work. Dr. Farmer and his extraordinary organization have been a force in making the world confront the health care needs of those who historically have never had access to proper care. Because of his dedication and compassion, critical health care services are now being administered around the globe to people who previously would have been left untreated. It is a great, great honor for me to help to, to ask you to welcome Dr. Paul Farmer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop already, you make me feel like I'm dead. Um, I won't forget those of you up there. Those lights are bright, but I know that uh, I've always wanted to speak in this room. I've been here, uh, as have many members of the Harvard community, to listen to others speak. And uh, I thought it would be a lot of fun to be able to shift one's eyes around and look at everybody, all, all 360 degrees practically. And I just want to say thank you um, for uh, allowing me to give this uh, lecture. It's a special uh, venue and an unusual one, one that I like very much. The, I don't have to talk very much. I just get to talk with you and, and uh, to respond to questions and comments and criticisms. About the, uh, the remark you made about not working in policy, well, you see, that's why I come here, so that I can learn from everybody here and uh, maybe conscript some people into the... I shouldn't use military metaphors, I'm sorry, but I was just, uh, to, to have uh, the more people who know about policy and government, which is what we were discussing at dinner, um, help those of us who have approached these same problems, the ones I'm going to talk about tonight, from a very different perspective than, say, from the perspective of policy uh, or government. And I, so I'm going to, uh, first, before I begin, though, I'd like to thank my students uh, who are my freshman students who are all here tonight. I'm going to be uh, taking roll from up here, so I'll find out if you're all here. But we had class tonight, and, and I was reluctant to, to give a, a talk at all unless they, they could be here, and they're all here today. I also have um, um, two guests, um, one of them, uh, Dr. Anita Asimwe from Rwanda, who is, has been gracious enough. Maybe if you could just to stand. who is the, uh, a leader in her country, a country where there is a certain optimism, amazingly, that I've never seen before. And it's people like Dr. Asimwe who are uh, struggling to take on some of the really uh, biggest challenges. When I'll be speaking to them tonight. They're, they're, they're my heroes. Another is, my other guest is Dr. Jorge Perez. Um, I think he's here. Oh, there he is. This is Dr. Perez. <laughs> who, in addition to being my colleague, uh, is also a close uh, personal friend and uh, the founding director of the National AIDS Program in Cuba. And um, Anita, who, uh, Dr. Asimwe, is, who is starting uh, what we all hope will be a long career fighting this fight, and Dr. Perez, who has been fighting the fight for equity, social justice, and uh, good outcomes from, for his patients. These are. Um, heroes to me, so I'm glad they're here tonight. So I'm going to start with a couple of stories, because um, even though we're going to talk about policy, I promise, and even government, um, uh, I think uh, if we're going to, um, if we, those of us who work in, for example, in clinical medicine, are able to make any s significant contribution to policy discussions, policy debates, um, then one of the ways we're going to do that is by thinking about those we're serving. And, uh, and I'm, I won't apologize for uh, what may seem uh, a graphic image here. Um, this looks like something out of George Jetson uh, TV show, whatever that was called, the Jetson. Is this the... I don't even know where images are being. Is this the right thing to push? <laughs> ah, there we go. Now, again, I'm not going to apologize. There are lots of reasons I won't apologize. Um, one is because I have only 20 minutes, uh, and, uh, and then we talk together. Uh, another is because this is the sort of problem that people like Dr. Asimwe 
Dr. Perez, myself, many people, some in this room tonight, um, we have to uh, face this. And of course, the, the burden is not ours. The problems are not ours. There are people like this young man who, whose name is Joseph. And, um, and some, especially at Harvard, I find, have asked me, well, um, are you using this image with his permission? And uh, when I told him this, he really chuckled a lot at that. So see, there is going to be a happy ending to this. Uh, and he said, well, of course you can use my image. Um, I rarely get invited to give talks at Harvard. So, <laughs> however, he does get invited to give talks, and you'll, you'll see why in a second. So this young man, and I think you can guess um, that he's there with his mother. Um, I think you can guess that. Um, when, it, when all else fails, there's mom. And... Uh, and he had given up, he, this, this young man had given up. He'd been wandering around the city of Port-au-Prince looking for care. And as my colleagues will know, probably just by looking at him, even though they, neither of them has seen this picture, um, this is a man who has two diseases. The one that you're guessing, AIDS, uh, but also tuberculosis. And he has them both. And these are the most common uh, you know, enemies. And I, am gonna, I won't use any more military metaphors because I'm going to... Uh, talk briefly about Rwanda as well. But these are our big enemies, uh, tuberculosis and HIV, malaria, another one. Those three pathogens alone are the big three infectious killers of adults and children in much of the world. In fact, in all of the world, HIV is the leading infectious killer of young adults, people the age of this fellow, Joseph. And uh, so when he arrived, and this picture was taken by one of my stu former students uh, from Harvard Medical School, um, a remarkable uh, man who's actually in Haiti now, in the same village where he uh, first saw this patient. And I was working in another village, the one that I've been living in for a long time, which David actually pronounced correctly, <laughs> Kanj. Some of you have been there. I have some friends here in the audience um, who've been there. And we have, as was mentioned, a major medical center there now, and the we here is a largely Haitian group. And uh, I got an electronic mail from this young physician who was at the time a Harvard Medical School student uh, asking if I would come to the town of Las Cabas and see this patient. And I said, sure, uh, and I'll, I'll come right away. And, uh, and I did, and I saw I met Joseph and I met his mother and we talked a little bit about what should be done because he had these two diseases at the same time and that was the reason they asked me to come and see him, not because he had, if he had just one or the other, uh, they wouldn't have conferred with me because it's really um, something that they're accustomed to doing. And um, I remember hearing this man, Joseph, whimper practically, it doesn't matter anymore. And his mother, of course, did not agree, neither did the rest of his family and many of his neighbors, the ones who carried them, him there on a stretcher that they confected out of, uh, of branches and some sheets. And I think it, I haven't actually been to his house, but uh, certainly my coworkers have. And it, was about, it took about an hour, I think, to get him uh, to medical attention. He, again, remember, this is someone who's already sought medical attention for months. But... The medical attention he needs is medical attention that would uh, relieve him of this consumptive and terrible process that was leading very rapidly to his death. And uh, so this is the face of AIDS in the world today. In, in not in, in, it's not the only face, of course, because right now we're seeing the face of AIDS be gendered more and more. That's a verb. And the majority of Patients in Rwanda, certainly, for example, I think uh, would be women, and in Haiti also. Um, but this is the face of AIDS in a very, um, uh, in a very real way, in, in the way that we would see uh, in clinic on a daily basis in our work in Haiti. Uh, but this is, the next image is also the face of AIDS. It's the same man six months later. And... Um, this is what the drugs that we're always arguing about, and again, this is, this is why I want to turn it over to the policy question. You've heard policy arguments that it is neither sustainable nor cost-effective to use these expensive drugs in places as poor as Haiti. And I think you can see that even if we clinicians have not mastered the argumentation fully, you can see why we feel passionately 
that this is not the approach that we can follow, the policy approach, that in fact there has to be other things that we do um, in order to either make those drugs more accessible, make them less expensive, uh, put in place the infrastructure necessary to use them wisely. The, and the infrastructure necessary to use them wisely is the other part of the policy discussion I'd like to launch tonight. Because we don't know um, exactly what those infrastructure requirements might be. We have a good idea. And sometimes what we find in our advocacy work, which is quite different from our clinical work, because I, no argument was necessary with this man's mother or family members. We didn't have to convince them. We didn't have to say, for example, well, ma'am, just because your son is a Haitian peasant, it's, it's okay that it's not cost effective to take care of him. We'll do it anyway. We didn't have to say that. She would never imagine in a million years that we'd bring that up. And of course, we did not. Those are debates we have in places like Boston or London or Tokyo or Paris. I've never been to Tokyo, but it sounded good. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and these are the debates that take place in capital cities and in, in, and in circles, which I frequent, and, and they would be called policy circles. And somehow, we're trying somehow to make this a compelling argument in and of itself. Not anecdotal, because we can show many, many pictures like this. Don't worry, I won't. Um, but there's another face of AIDS, too. And it's the same guy again. I'm going to show you another picture of him, but this one taken, I think, last August. And here he is doing his bit as a health outreach worker and health educator working uh, on AIDS prevention. And I can tell you, if you, it's not a great image in the background, but it's, it's that picture of him, which uh, he is using. He's projecting a picture of himself um, in speaking about his experience. And uh, I later gave him uh, a copy of this, these two pictures uh, and it was, appeared in a, in a report published by the World Health Organization. I gave it to him and he looked at it and said, yeah, I'm a star. <laughs> so he was rather blasé about the whole thing, but he is now busy working. Uh, he's also doing the work that he usually does, but he's working um, to help prevent this calamity um, uh, among others, and uh, again, this has been a very vital part of our work. And again, how can we bring people like Joseph into policy debates more directly? Now, I'm just going to use images to get to the infrastructure question, because many of you who are, who are involved in setting policy and thinking about healthcare problems of poor people know that it's not possible to dismiss these arguments regarding drug pricing, regarding infrastructure, and we don't. We have labored along with many others, um, some people actually from this school, and uh, to reduce drug prices so that these, the fruits of modernity, the modern medicine, can be made, uh, can be used uh, in places like Haiti. And I haven't forgotten the title of my talk, which is about dangerous places. And there are many reasons that places are dangerous and that violence occurs. Um, and I'm sure that we could spend all night just arguing about what those uh, reasons might be. But from Haiti and from other places where we've worked, poverty and social inequalities are at the heart of so many of these problems and so much of the violence we see. I saw a friend of mine at the medical school. She's from here, um, and or she, she was here. I think she still is. I don't know how she's related to Kennedy School now, Sean Bowen. And she... Uh, said that she'd run into a friend of hers from the K school and who said, uh, Paul Farmer is going to be speaking tonight. What's he going to be talking about? And she said, eh, it'll be about inequality again, whatever the title is. <laughs> so I said, thank you, Sean. That's a strong endorsement. Um, and, but she's right, of course. I am going to talk about in, uh, inequality as, as at the heart of this problem of making these, the fruits of modernity uh, available, but also at the heart of a great deal of violence. So. There's a, uh, a student here, actually one of the freshmen I mentioned, who just came here probably yesterday or the day before from this town. I don't know where Matt is hiding. He's over there somewhere. Um, a Harvard freshman who spent uh, some time uh, last summer before coming to Harvard in this town. And I, I don't know if you can see I should, uh, that this is uh, another, it's an abandoned building, the first of two abandoned buildings I'm going to show you. Um, and when we said, well, we can do this work in Conj, in the place where we work, and also, and then people said, well, you can't do it in a public health setting, in a public clinic. 
it, there's just no faith in the public health system in Haiti. And, and we said, well, why don't we scale up these efforts then in public settings only? And the man you saw just a minute ago who was treated was treated in a public clinic, not in the center we had built. And after fighting that struggle, and that was also a policy discussion, they said, well, you're certainly not going to be able to do it again. You know, it's really, so you did it in one place and maybe one other place. And there, there you know, people are saying this quite directly to me, you know, well, come on, be realistic. You know, be pragmatic. I said, what's more pragmatic than practicing medicine in difficult places like Haiti? But I, I've learned, and my mother taught me this, it's not a good idea to be sarcastic. So I usually just nod and say, okay, well, we'll try it in another place. So here's an abandoned building. Um, and I didn't push that button, but thank you. This must be the dean speeding me up. Um, <laughs> but that's the same building after this transformative process, which again, I'm glad some people here have witnessed. That is, taking an abandoned building, which is actually given to us uh, by a peasant organization. We said, no, don't give it to us. Give it to the Ministry of Health, because the Ministry of Health is the guarantor of access for poor people, and that's what we're trying to do. And we rebuilt this with our Haitian colleagues, and this was an inauguration day of, of a new hospital from an abandoned building. And I'm showing you the human face of AIDS and taking on some of these, and just these images about the infrastructural challenges so that we can start uh, thinking about the policy questions. And again, for me, this is going to be an instructive process as, as well. But I was told that in this lecture, I was to ask a question. And pose it at the end. I'm going to pose it in the middle, though, with your blessing. That's okay. So I'm about to pose the question. You've seen the, some evidence, again, from a, an individual and, and an institution of what can be done. I think also what needs to be done. So here's the question. What is it, what happens if we don't intervene? What happens if we don't respond uh, aggressively or more aggressively to problems like these two? Because they talked about AIDS and tuberculosis. These are the health problems of poverty. That's the question I want to ask tonight. But unfortunately, um, there are many answers to this question known already. Because in plenty of places, it is very late to intervene. And for example, if you go to the Nyanza province on the shores of Lake Victoria and Ken Kenya, you'll, you can easily see a scene like this. And I'm actually in the back, about halfway. I don't know if you can... Make, anyway, the, you see lots of children. That was a joke. Uh, you see lots of children uh, and a lot of older people, but not a lot of parents, not a lot of young adults. They're, they're, they're the missing generation. And if you look around this room, a lot of people um, are in that age group of 20 to 40 or 50 years old, and th that generation is, is gone. Um, and, of course, for those of you who are old enough to have grandchildren, um, you can imagine what it'd be like just doing childcare duty when you're, say, 70, picking up children. You know, it's not easy to do. Um, all you need to do is be 45 and have a robust seven-year-old and know that you'd, it's not easy to lift them off the ground anymore once you, once you hit a certain age. Uh, and I'm talking about the parents, not the kids. So it's, it's really a, a horrible tragedy that's already occurred in many places in the world, and, and it's ongoing. And that will be, and, and I'd like to, to, to remind you before we start this discussion, I know that last, year, last night there was a, a, a conference on Darfur here, and there often are discussions of human rights here. There are just two human rights. This is the only text, I promise. I was told not to bring text slides. You don't have to read it, but it's just to remind me to, that there, are, there is a human rights frame, framework that just as there is, of course, a medical framework or a public health framework to underpin the kind of claims that I'm staking here and the, the debate that we'd like to have. But there's also a human rights framework. And that is, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are at least a couple of articles that seem very... To, to refer very pointedly to these kinds of problems, that is, uh, the problem of inequality and uh, the problem of the lack of access to the fruits of modernity for people living in poverty and with a major infectious disease. And when we think about how to rebuild and how much it needs to be done, and this is all I'm going to say about violence um, and the impact that it has on healthcare in general in the hopes that we can have a debate. I'll just let you know that um, I have 
in, worked in Haiti now for over two decades, and so I think I'm on coup number 10. I think there have been about that many ministers of help in the years that I've been in Haiti, maybe more. And uh, I was at dinner uh, talking to uh, Tim Collins about, uh, and the dean about some things that had happened to us in Haiti over the last year, um, ambulances stolen, kidnapping of staff. And, and I realized uh, not too long ago that in many of the places where our group has worked, Haiti, Chiapas, Guatemala, Peru during a civil war, and now uh, Rwanda, which fortunately is, is, is um, really not uh, a conflict-ridden place right now, but in each of these places, uh, massive uh, violence, political violence, has really altered our ability to provide good medical care. And so, but that's the part for all, of, for, both, for all of us to discuss together. Just an image to remind us of how, this is a picture I just took three weeks ago in a church in Rwanda, um, which is um, where people sought shelter um, from what was going on there in 1994 and did not find it. They didn't find it. And I think many of you know what happened. Um, and this, uh, if these events 11 years ago, uh, of course, very much alter the, uh, the, the nature of what it is we'll be doing, even though we're going to be focusing, as we always do, on medical problems. And I, on the way to visit one of the clinics, the very place we'll be working, I was looking at this, actually, um, a friend of mine, uh, Polly Rutgers, uh, who was in Rwanda with us last fall, was uh, really the person who was telling me uh, more about this process. What do you do when you've had a violent eruption, as has happened in Rwanda or Guatemala or Haiti? What is the way, right way to proceed um, to heal these wounds um, so that they don't separate, if I can push the metaphor? And one of the answers there has been to bring communities together to discuss what happened. And, and sometimes, as you can see in this image, uh, to say, well, this is what happened on that day, and this is who did it. And it's, it seems very far afield from the medical work that we do, and yet in me each of these places, we've found that these are not scars that go away um, without being addressed. And just to give you one um, example, and this is the last image. This is where we were sent, thank you very much Dr. Asimwe for sending us to, when we were told we were going to go to work in a hospital, there's the hospital sign right there, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, we asked the Ministry of Health to sign us a place rather than to go ourselves and uh, to choose something and, and actually we were thrilled um, to, to be able to work on this project. This was just taken again very recently. You can see that there are bullet holes and, uh, uh, in the, on the wall there and the sign has fallen over, but I have very little doubt that um, if, if I'm invited back here again in a year or Dr. Asimwe or other partners, or those from Partners in Health are going to be working with the Ministry of Health, I have no doubt that we'll be able to show you a picture very similar to the one I showed you from that Haitian village, that this is a place that can and must be rebuilt. And I asked my question, what is the cost of inaction? And the question of practicing medicine in violent places, um, again, I want to leave that for debate. But another question that I would ask, the second one, is what scars are left by massive political violence and what role for not only for public health and medicine but for policy in addressing these effectively? And now I'd like to open it up for debate. We now have uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, there are four microphones. One's here, one's here, one's here, and one's here. We'll just rotate around. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments. The first is that uh, this is for questions, and so we ask that, uh, that good questions we find have several characteristics. First, the person identifies themselves. Second of all, and you're sick of hearing this, those of you know me, they tend to be short. And finally, they end in a question mark. Um, and so with that, uh, uh, if you have a question, please come to this microphone here or here, up here and up here. And again, we'll just rotate through, start right there. Hi. 
I'm Julie O'Brien. I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School. And I just have a question regarding your funding policy and philosophy and um, how, I mean, your, your biography does talk a little bit about your private funding to date. But what is your perspective on USAID funding and do you use it and what's your, what's your position on that? Well, our funding policy is you give us money and we'll do work. <laughs> Um, that's the simple version of the policy. Um, our, our organization, and I, I should say that we've, we actually have, there are more than one organization. First of all, Partners in Health is a public charity. And uh, it has, in each of these places, and, and it, you know, I should have memorized Public Health in Kenya, Rwanda, because we have a stamp. And that was the proof to me that we'd really made it, is when we got to Kigali and someone gave us a stamp that said, Partners in Health in Kenya, Rwanda. But I'll just mess up the pronunciation, so I'll wait till next time. But in each of these settings, we have a sister organization, and, which is locally directed. Um, so in, in Haiti, that sister organization is called Zamina Sante, which is um, Partners in Health in Haitian. And it's an organization that's very large, actually, in terms of a number of staff much larger than public and health, pu partners, partners in Health. It's not like I was going to say Republicans in Health, which is really <laughs> not a... Uh, it's sort of an oxymoron, but in any case, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm sorry. Um, so so um, our, our, you know, the, the evolution of these policies over time, we were very young when we, you know, 20, 20 something years ago, the director of Partners in Health, when I point out in public that she and I have worked together for 23 years, she said, yeah, I was 10 when we started working together. <laughs> it's not true, actually. Um, but we, we started this as students, and you know, again, that's why I'm particularly gratified that my students are here tonight. We started this effort as students, and we were trying to find our way. And remember, um, we started in Haiti, which had, a very, which had and has a very fractious relationship to my country, and from your accent, I'd say yours as well. Um, so there's this 200-year baggage that goes with Haiti and the United States, the two oldest countries in the hemisphere. Ours um, was the first, Haiti was the second. And uh, everybody in Haiti knows that, of course, uh, but not that many Americans uh, know it. They don't know that these are the two oldest countries in the hemisphere, and therefore, they actually have the two most inter intertwined histories. Not, it's not a pretty story. And I'm not talking just about the easy stuff, like the US military occupation from 1915 to 1934. Uh, that gave rise to the modern Haitian army, which in its most recent guide stole four of our ambulances, and I'm still angry about it. I'll smile, though, because one does that in fora. Um, but, uh, you know, we are we're very concerned about U.S. policy towards Haiti in, in, in all the years that I've been there and, and we have worked there. And I see three major types of uh, historical period in Haiti. A family dictatorship, that is just, well, I've been there. So I'm not going to speculate on the, the years before that, unless someone asks about that. A family dictatorship, military rule, and elected governments. Those are the three big divisions, because uh, we're supposed to be talking about policy and government here. And um, unfortunately, a lot of support was forthcoming from our government for the, uh, the first two species of government. The, uh, you, know, you look at, for example, um, official aid, not just from the United States, but particularly from the United States, to um, the even the military, and including the international financial institutions. I once went uh, to the, I'm not going to name the international financial institutions, but it's a global <laughs> bank of sorts. Um, you know, the thing about giving a talk at the K school is, of course, you always meet someone who comes up and says, well, I'm the director of the World Bank. <laughs> and uh, so you got to be careful. But I, um, I went to, I didn't mention the name of the bank, but I went there uh, actually with a colleague who's here tonight and met uh, a high-level official in that bank, and he, was, he or she was saying that, uh, that he or she had negotiated one of the first uh, loans from this institution to uh, Haiti. And, and you know, the first thing, I'm, I have to keep the panic-stricken look off of my face because the first thing I'm thinking is, what year and to whom? And, um, you know, you can guess the answer to that. It was not to a democratically, uh, to an elected government, but to a military junta. And, uh, and so there's all of this. It's not just USAID. You mentioned USAID, um, which is, you know, again, I think it's better. As I get older, I think, well, it's not if it's a problem, it's our problem, because it's my 
you know, tax dollars and yours, although some of you in this room are paying considerably more in taxes than I am. Um, it's, it's, our, it's our support that, that you know, creates the, um, the public edifice of aid and, you know, that you mentioned, um, and international policies and foreign policy, political policy. So, again, I think, you know, to take responsibility for that, um, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm saying, well, the policies were so bad that we would have nothing to do with it because the policies were bad, but we had everything to do with it. it and for years and years, we did not accept that sort of funding. And the big question for us in recent years has been the, the push to expand our work. And I would say that, and I will wrap this up because I could go on a lot about this, but you know, the push to expand the work has come from people like this family to whom I introduced you, or this town. And really, 15 years ago, we didn't have aspirations to work far away or to cover a seventh of the surface area of Haiti with these services. We should have had aspirations. We didn't know also that we should be working with the public health sector. Uh, and we learned a lot, you know, and some would say we took too long to learn it. Um, but as time went by, and I think we refined what it is we were doing, working with the public health sector, same thing we'll be doing in Rwanda, um, it, we also tried to listen carefully to our Haitian interlocutors and those who ran our sister organization. And after the creation of programs by the U.S. government to respond specifically to AIDS um, and working with uh, professionals who work in groups, uh, organizations like the Centers for Disease Control, we began receiving a limited amount of funding from U.S. government sources. And again, at the behest of our coworkers, and I think with some uh, success, but we've always said that we're not going to alter our policies and practices either in terms of prevention of HIV, which we, we, you know, we consider ourselves to be expert in that field. And the we as a large group of people have been working on this problem for 15 years more. We, we, do, we're, we won't be changing our approach to this based on either the whim of a funder or, um, or what we regard to be ideologically laden policies that are being formulated. So that's been our approach, um, and we're very grateful for the assistance that we get, but we have to keep our practices and policies at the highest possible level. And that will be true, I'm sure, in our other collaborations in Rwanda and elsewhere. In Rwanda, we've had, again, help from private sources. Um, some of them in this room tonight, actually, although they'd kill me if I mentioned it. But um, and we're, we, that's the cornerstone of our liberty, is support from private, in, private individuals and families and occasionally churches and foundations. That's the cornerstone of our liberty as a social justice organization. Uh, thank you. Right up here. Uh, Dr. Farmer, thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Noah Sawyer. I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. My question is about um, the interaction between politics and international aid. Um, so much of this work goes on in countries with pretty despicable governments. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. Oh, you should talk. Yeah, well. <laughs> just kidding. Just, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, you won't find any argument from me on that, but I'm just wondering how you go about going about international aid work in a country when, without giving legitimacy to a government that you'd rather see removed from office. Well, you know, uh, thank you. It, you didn't tell me to ask all the hardest questions first. They could have, you could have let me warm up a little, you know, and I could... You know, ask so. easy questions first. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be something like, well, I'm a Scorpio, and... Um, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I think, again, this gets very back to the question that you just asked, you know, and the, our obligations, we try to lay them out in, in formal terms. And that means, you know, if you look at our, at our e even the work we do at Harvard Medical School or at the Brigham Women's Hospital, we've insisted on having, to say nothing of obviously work through Partners in Health, and this is very intertwined work, We've insisted that we're able to say, this is our mission. Um, and our mission is, to, you know, this is a kind of corny sounding term, and we, it's derivative, like many of our ideas we got from other people, people living in Haiti or Rwanda. Or, but uh, uh, the idea of making a preferential option for the poor, it sounds grand or maybe to some people even silly, but it is a very good way of staying focused in the middle of turmoil. And you remember, I was hoping you'd ask questions like this, in truth, about what you call despicable governments. And, uh, and I think 
one of the big problems with using the quality of governance as a criterion for service is that, of course, some of the places with the worst governments have greatest need, and there's a, a you know, direct correlation between that. Other places um, which have great need also, I think, have very impressive governance, and still you might hear just the opposite in a public forum. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I could go on and on about some of our own experiences in Haiti, uh, Guatemala, and even Rwanda, uh, which I know less well, where we've seen either very bad governance or, in the case of Rwanda, some very enlightened governance and good governance um, that really still hasn't found a fan club outside of uh, certain circles because there's all of this ideological freight and also hit the freight of history um, pushing up against um, the reading of social facts in places like the ones in which I work, the dangerous and difficult or post-conflict places in which we work. So it is not a criterion for our engagement. Our criterion, uh, principal criterion is need. And the degree to which we'll be involved, however, with a uh, government will be determined by our own process, which I called in another talk at the Kennedy School, the process of discernment. And someone said, you should just like drop that term. It's not very <laughs> revealing. So I actually have dropped it until I come back here. But discernment, you know, the process of going through and judging the facts as best you can. And, and, and we're fortunate because, of course, we work with lots of people. You know, just to give you an idea of numbers, we, we have over 1,000 coworkers in Haiti, most of them people who live in or grew up in poverty, very good guides to what we should be doing. Some of my peers, my fellow physicians and nurses, are also good guides. Not, not, not all of them, just as they wouldn't be here. Um, but people living in poverty, of course, are experts on that topic. And we can get good advice often if, we, if, if we're simply able to listen. So step one is to use need as a criterion. And also, again, we ended up, I think, in some of the places we've worked by accident and happenstance. Uh, this time, though, I'm proud to tell you our latest uh, effort, the one I mentioned earlier, actually we spent a lot of time um, trying to plan a project um, and, and working with our colleagues in Rwanda to get it right. And, and to learn from what we've done elsewhere. So I think that it's, uh, it's one of the great, you know, you look at uh, places like the one discussed here last night, um, the Sudan. Um, you know, wouldn't it be a pity for people who are suffering uh, today, now, as this man was, um, if, um, if bad governance meant also an absence of solidarity from people like you and me. And uh, so, it, so it was, I mean, let's take a harder example, Guatemala or Haiti or El Salvador, places where our own bad governance was very related to um, you know, difficult and dangerous situations for the people of those countries. And uh, in each instance, I think it is possible to make bridges of solidarity with people who are beleaguered by some of these very social forces you mentioned without compromising your ability to do a good job um, and, you know, it's, I, I just would close up by saying that it's impossible to not struggle with that question and to, to think that it's going to be easy to answer it. It's, a, it's an ongoing struggle. Up here. Good evening, Dr. Farmer. My name is Tannen Carroll. I'm actually a um, joint medical student and Kennedy School student. So I've been thinking a lot about the interplays of public policy and medicine like you've talked about. Um, one of the issues I feel like is with antiretrovirals. And I think in public policy circles, we've kind of dumbed down the, the actual discussion. And one of the reasons for that is I feel like we haven't dealt with a lot of the ethical issues on the level of like um, antiretrovirals when taken, um, when taken sporadically actually um, breed highly resistant um, viruses that are, that are proven to be spread to other people as highly resistant vir um, viruses that are resistant to other forms of antiretrovirals. Especially in these areas, um, I think that that's a big issue. And then also the ethical issue of that is still an uncurable disease. And those interplays of like science and policy and how those come to play, how do you reconcile those um, just in general? Um, well, two things I'd say. First of all, thank you for the question. And, and it's, it's really, a, in my view, wholly appropriate to ask you know, complex questions like that about complex problems like AIDS in a place where there isn't a lot of infrastructure. Two things I'd say uh, in response to that. One 
is that um, the major problem of drug-resistant disease is in, um, for example, this country. And uh, some people estimate that in certain U.S. cities, a, a quarter of all new infections are from drug-resistant disease. Um, and so that fact is not lost on many people working in poor countries. And I've had people, colleagues, tell me, so you're telling us that it's your prerogative to develop drug-resistant disease, but we have to leave our AIDS completely untreated and die with fully susceptible disease. Not a good policy option. So, and, and that, if you reject that policy option, that is that uh, these drugs will only be used in rich world settings or affluent settings because of the problem of drug resistance, if you reject that as untenable ethically, as I think you're suggesting, then the, the question becomes a different one. How do we best prevent the emergence of acquired drug resistance in taking on epidemics of infectious disease? Because you mentioned AIDS, but the same is true, of course, of tuberculosis, bacterial infections, the list goes on and on. Um, most infections, most infectious pathogens acquire resistance to the drugs we have to treat them. Antivirals, antibacterials, antimalarials, et cetera. So it's not a new question. And the, the, the better question, how do we best prevent the emergence of acquired drug resistance, um, is, is one that we can already begin to answer. We should begin with a certain humility and say, well, we don't know exactly, but we do know some things. For example, having supervised care, um, which I find very difficult to get done in Boston compared to Haiti. Yeah. And uh, for ex why is that? Well, because we have community health workers who visit each patient in, in Haiti, and uh, it's m dip more difficult to promote that agenda here in Boston. Uh, again, on policy grounds. Fortunately, we've ignored those, uh, that council and done it anyway. And our, our, Dr. Heidi Beffrews at uh, the Brigham is directing a project along with many others in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, because the big problem here in this country is drug-resistant disease. That's the first thing I'd say. The second is, is, a, is an anthropological insight. In any country I've worked, even the poorest one, which so far is Haiti, which, which is poorer than, than, than Rwanda, in every country where I've worked, um, I have never met families who just give up and say, well, we, you know, there's nothing we can do about this, our child being sick or our spouse being sick or our sibling being sick. They, I've never seen that yet. So you saw this mother taking Joseph to the clinic. She'd already dragged him all over the place. Um, and he dragged himself all over the place. The idea that people will not seek therapy because they're poor is, a, is, is very mistaken. So in every capital city in Africa, even five years ago, you would find antiretrovirals on sale, without any exception that we know about. So, you know, from Kigali to Kampala to certainly to the affluent cities in, so in South Africa, you found these drugs. So the idea that they weren't there was actually not true. They were there, they just weren't available to poor people, and they still, by and large, are not. And that meant that people were doing things like selling off their belongings to buy a couple of months' worth of, a of antiretrovirals. It didn't mean that they weren't um, taking these drugs at all. It just meant they were ruining themselves and their families trying to stay alive, as, as humans are wont to do. So there, that's a recipe for even more rapid acquisition of drug resistance. So fortunately, in my, in my view, the ethical response, which is that we have to have equity, um, Sean Bowen predicted I'd say that, we have to have equity uh, as the cornerstone of our interventions and make sure that people living in poverty with AIDS also have access to care. That's the ethical response. It also happens to be the best policy response to slow the acquisition of drug-resistant disease. But thank, you, thank you for bringing that up. Right down here. My name is Suzanne Smith, and you were right on target by worrying about your audience because I'm from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Yeah, but you're our allies, so I'm not worried about you. <laughs> most importantly, we love you. Most importantly, I'm a, I'm a Kennedy School graduate, class of 2000. I'm here for Bob Bain's performance measurement course, so my question has to do with success. I am interested in hearing your vision for what success would look like as far as an infra infrastructure in these countries to support and sustain health. 
you alluded a number of times to the difficult interaction of nonprofits and governments and, and, and foreign governments in a number of places and how we seem to reinvent working with each other every time there's a new issue that comes along. With due, all due respect to the policy issues, I'm really interested in knowing what you think would work and of course, then the easy question, how would we get there? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm plagued, as you might imagine, by the, haunted by the same question. But, you know, and I'm sure you have been answering in your own mind that question as, as I have. I think that, you know, you take, take a problem like the one I just described. For you, if, if this was a, not a forum where I was only supposed to talk 20 minutes, um, I would say, you know what really happened? We started rolling out HIV prevention and care and simply followed the rates, for example, of tetanus vaccination or polio or measles or prenatal care. And we found that in every instance when we did this through, rebuilt the infrastructure using uh, the public health infrastructure, we found that we strengthened primary health care. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I have in my mind an, I an idea of what this would look like, as, as, as you, 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 I'm sure, do also, a, a place where uh, where people know that, that they have a certain health care problem, for example, that they want to have their children vaccinated or they're, they're looking for prenatal care, they know that they will go there and find that and that it, there won't be users' fees and barriers that prevent p people living in poverty from having access to these. Now, so, you know, and, I, and I'll, be, I'll pass on afterwards, we'll, we'll trade information, I'll send you our, our writings about this, how we can use a problem, the latest thing in terms of an epidemic to address long-standing primary health care problems, because that's what's happened in our work in Haiti. And we're, we're sure it's going to happen in Rwanda, that, um, that in addressing one or two problems, HIV, TB, then we're, of course, going to be addressing everything from malaria to you know, low rates of vaccination to outbreaks of, of cholera, should they occur. How to get there? Well, you know, thinking about this in a, uh, on a, an almost a, a philosophical level, if I can, got to be careful because there are also philosophers in the room. Um, again, that always happens at Harvard, too. Um, you know, there is a shift that one could advocate. If people, public health warriors like yourself, who have policy experience and training, um, and, and others, you know, the citizenry, were to say, well, what we need to do is take a problem that has been considered a private problem. AIDS has been considered a private problem, not in the sense of privacy, but in the sense of not a public problem. But if it's the leading infectious cause of adult death in the world, then maybe it's a good idea to sh make that shift and make it a public problem and response to it a public good. That happened with tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Now, the results are still lacking because tuberculosis remains uh, a huge problem in the world and certainly the leading problem for people like Joseph who, who, with HIV whose leading cause of death in the poor world is, is tuberculosis. However, that argument has been had already. Is TB case defining, is tuberculosis case finding and treatment a public good or not? And almost every country in the world thinks it is. And that's because it's airborne. And because we saw, and you know, back to my medical school colleague, wherever he went, back to his question, we know that drug resistance will be acquired uh, and then it'll be transmitted uh, just as with HIV, as he was discussing. So we've already had that argument. And I think. We ought to, as a, as a society, and this sounds you know, grand, a global society, if, if you know, here we are, you know, yesterday we had people from Nigeria, Botswana, uh, and several, uh, Rwanda, Haiti, um, and, uh, and gathered together here at Harvard to think about some of these very questions. If we can move more of these problems into the realm of public good and deal with them collectively rather than piecemeal, I think that would be a huge step forward. Um, for these major epidemics. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. Good evening. My name is Heidi Kummer. I'm a physician and a relatively recent graduate of the BU School of Public Health. There are other schools in town. Um, <laughs> my concentration was in health law, bioethics, and human rights. And my question is, groups like MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, very much supported the creation of the International Criminal Court. They're also, aside from providing health care, their other main function, as they see it, is timonage, or a sort of accounting of things that they see. And yet there are at least two factions, maybe more, 
on whether or not physicians who provide care in these conflict zones have a responsibility to help the prosecutors in war crimes, and whether it's more important to get the guy or whether we risk access to all patients we want to treat. I'd like to know how you feel about that. Well, there aren't two factions. There are 77 factions inside Doctors Without Borders. I'm kidding. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, there's a, and, it's, and you know, the case of Rwanda is a, is a, is a very great one in part because uh, there's a very courageous book. You, I bet, have read it, but many of you may not have. It's by uh, Fiona Terry. And um, it, I think it's called Doomed to Repeat. And in it, she reflects on that organization's experience in several different conflict-torn countries. One of them, um, not Rwanda itself, although they were there, uh, but Zaire. And as you know, many of the people involved in the killings in Rwanda fled to Zaire. And the international humanitarian community um, was very involved in setting up camps. And um, after the genocide stopped in Rwanda, um, the complaint from the government was that the perpetrators of these crimes were in the camps. And uh, that they shouldn't be in the camps. They should be disarmed. Um, they needed to be disarmed desperately, or they would launch raids into Rwanda. And this warning came many times from Kigali, and all that came to pass, and very much more. Um, and as you know, this, the conflict in that region was in some very meaningful ways triggered by the failure to disarm the authors of the genocide in Rwanda. But that's not why I'm bringing up the book. I'm bringing up the book because in the appendices of the book, you will find some papers that were found in the camps after the camps were dismantled by force by the Rwandans in Rwanda. And I was, you know, I don't think a lot of people there were surprised to read documents uh, that were airway bills for armaments shipments that were addressed to the Minister of Defense, Republic of Rwanda, Goma, Zaire. These were not machetes. These were heavy armaments that came in giant planes and landed at the Goma airstrip. And, you know, I, I, in reading this book and reading the many examples given, I, um, it's an effort for me not to side over much with my fellow physicians, and in this, this case, my fellow public health people, because that's natural for us, for you, for me, for others who are... But that, they're not the victims of these errors, and that was the conclusion of Fiona Terry, who, who I haven't met, but I already admire her um, for writing this. Um, the primary victims, of course, people living in poverty, whether they were the unguilty uh, refugees or those who were the victims of the violence that ensued because the disarmament never happened. But what is the role, you're asking, of a humanitarian organization? And I don't want to have a cop-out answer, but I would say we're not a humanitarian organization. We're a social justice organization that focuses on medicine and public health. And uh, even in our incarnations at the Brigham, and the medical school, we still say that. And that language is unfamiliar to many in our field, in medicine and public health, but it's not unhelpful. Um, because I think it, it shows that there's not one answer to that question. Uh, in some instances, I mean, we, we, one of the things I contemplated talking about was our project, a project that we did in Guatemala, uh, where we found ourselves, we went to Guatemala, we were invited there by Gua our Guatemalan uh, friends who had survived the war there, 200,000 people killed, um, mostly by uh, military, uh, most of them civilians. And we went back with them and they said, we have a medical project we'd like help on. And it was dysentering, digging up the dead. And there was an, an example where we were asked to help again with témoignage or to help document what had happened, and we did. And even in Haiti, where we were walking a very fine line, again, that, that's the, the danger. I'm going back to Haiti from here. And it's a very fine line. I mean, to get home from Rwanda uh, recently, um, I had to go through a veritable thicket of armaments. And they were not in Rwanda, but they were in Haiti. From the, you know, that long trip back from Africa to Haiti, uh, the worst part was all the guns on the way from Port-au-Prince Airport to uh, where we work. And even there, we have struggled with that question we haven't just said, well, we can't do anything because we'll lose our access. 
So I, I think it is a very fine line, and the only thing that's keeping us centered is this commitment to the sick. Um, and this is not, when we say we're not a humanitarian organization, it's not meant as a critique of humanitarian organizations. It's just that our primary function is not témoignage. It is assistance to the sick. We also do témoignage whenever we can. But that ranking for us is in that order. And, you know, the reason it's in that order is largely because that's what we're asked to do by those, by those who invite us there. Thank you. That's a, something, again, that, that I'm grappling with and hope to discuss tonight. So I thank you for the question. Time for two more questions up here. Hi, my name is Rebecca Benefiel, and I work at the Food Project, which is a nonprofit in Dorchester. And uh, thanks for making this a public, not just Harvard-based forum. I appreciate that. Um, my question has to do with sacrifice. Please leave. <laughs> <laughs> just one question, then I'll be out of here. I'm kidding. Um, my question has to do with sacrifice. I just finished Mountains Beyond Mountains, which was a pretty impressive book. And you talk about how change requires sacrifice, even from people like me who are pretty comfortable with our lives as they are. And I wonder, um, seeing Joseph's picture, the cost of inaction for him seems pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the cost of inaction is for me or for other people like me. You were right about the questions getting tougher. Um, <laughs> you know, of course, I'd be speculating, and, 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 uh, and I'm going to. <laughs> um, and, you know, a, a room like this is a good one uh, in many ways, not just because of the great layout. I, I know those are called loges, are they not? I just learned that tonight. Um, but uh, because, you know, in, the, in this room are people who are uh, very... You have doctors, you have students, um, you have very successful financiers and captains of industry and captainettes or whatever the word might be. <laughs> but everybody's brought here because they think that there must be a cost, not, not here to see me, but here to these fora, that there must be a cost to do nothing. And um, I find that tremendously inspiring. Because I've already concluded that there's a great cost for people like you and me who are comfortable to do nothing. And, um, and I'd just like to recommend to you, if, if I could, if it doesn't sound too predictably Harvard, a book um, that I read on Easter Sunday, or last Sunday. Wait, I'm not supposed to mention high holidays from any religion. Excuse me, strike that from the record. <laughs> I, I'll try to remember the date or whatever. Last Sunday. Um, and uh, it, it was, a, again, having come back from a really wonderful time in Rwanda and, uh, and Kenya. Because actually, one thing I didn't mention is that some of the sad stories we saw in Kenya 15 months ago had been addressed in the 15 months we hadn't been there. And that was, it was very good. And I was, but I have to tell you, it was really sad to have to go through that thicket of armaments um, to get home and to see, you know, the agony um, that I think a lot of people in, in that country, which has been so good to me and taught me so much, that's to say, hey, uh, the agony that people are in. And I, I read a book um, on Sunday um, called Bury the Chains by Adam Hochschild. It's a new book, and it's about the abolition of, uh, of slavery and the slave trade. And I, I guess because I was feeling that you know things were had slipped backwards in in Haiti and and that people were uns, uh, suffering unnecessarily, it was a good thing for me to read, and uh, and you asked me if I thought there was a cost, so I'm going to answer yes I do. And the thing that inspired me about this book is in the late 18th century, um, there were a lot of people who thought that even though they had nothing to do with the slave trade, they were not beneficiaries directly of the slave trade. They weren't involved. They weren't you know, gang-pressed sailors. They weren't owners of plantations in the British West Indies. Um, they were, to use the words of Adam Hochschild, uh, the citizenry, the, the common everyday Britons. Um, they weren't directly involved, but they thought there would be a great cost to them and to their society if they uh, continued to let this prevail, to let this, you know, abomination, slavery, continue. And that movement was just that. It was a movement that required organizing. And they didn't have jeeps. They had horses. And uh, I can't imagine it's interesting to travel 10,000 miles on a horse. Um, nothing against horses, but it just doesn't sound appealing. Back problems, what have you. And uh, they, they did that because they knew there was going to be a cost to let this not peculiar institution, but this abominable institution continue. 
And I do. I think that you know, if if I have a student come to me, you're not a student, but if I have a student come to me and say, you know, do you think I should do this? It's tempting to say, well, do whatever you want because you need to be happy in your work. Um, but it's also tempting to say, but there's going to be a cost if we continue to make grave errors in the management of problems like the ones we discussed tonight, whether they be mass violence or mass dyings due to epidemic disease. And uh, you know, there are, as I said, there are philosophers here tonight, so I don't know if that sounds like a, a philosophically sound response, but you bet I believe there's a cost. I think there's a cost to inequality, and the cost is violence. That violence comes from poverty and inequality in the modern world, and a great deal of it. Um, and, and that's the cost that we're all going to pay if we don't think about some of these problems. Last question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farmer. My name is Amy Finnegan, and I'm a student at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. My question is, um, rarely do, do we argue that providing health services is unhelpful or is, is a bad thing. But in settings of conflict, my experience is dynamics can be um, tenuous. They can be, they can be delicate. And I'm curious what your approach is or the approach of PIH in handling sort of interventions in settings of conflict. Because I think the, obviously the, the worst thing you want to do is, is, is exasperate the problems. Well, you know, that, that was the conclusion of the book that I mentioned by Fiona Terry, that they'd made things worse. That's why I thought it was such a brave book. Um, because that's something that, she, as she, she, in her analysis, she argues that NGOs and humanitarian organizations are very unlikely to engage in self-critical review. Um, actually, governments are more um, obliged to do that, although they do it unwillingly, by and large, um, because you know we sometimes force them to. Sometimes we're too busy watching, you know, action movies or something, but. Um, and I, I'm as guilty as the next person. I'm sure you all watch action movies every evening. Um, <laughs> but, you know, NGOs and humanitarian organizations um, and, uh, and even ones who have pretentious pretensions like ours to be, uh, yes, we work on, with high-tech medicine and work on, with, I hope, a certain expertise, but it's still a social justice organization. We do not do self-criticism well. And um, that's one of the reasons there, there's no autopsy of projects. And you know, Haiti's a veritable graveyard of projects, by the way. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, R R Rwanda, too, is, is dotted with NGOs, um, not entirely clear what their contribution is going to be, their long-term contribution. So I think that the trap that you mentioned, the tenuous situation you describe, is really, it's inescapable as a, as a, as a trap. I mean, sorry, it's, in, it's inevitable that there will be that trap. But it is not a trap we have to fall into. And the, the ways in which we can avoid falling into that tra trap, I think, include having, you know, again, I've, I've laid my cards out and said, I think having a commitment to the destitute sick or those, uh, the, those who suffer most is really almost the best compass that you can find. Not the only compass you can find, uh, but it's almost the best one. It, it would be a very similar outcome if you followed the disease. And, and um, so I, I think that it's not foolproof to say, well, we, our allegiance, if our allegiance to the destitute sick is threatened in any way, we know that we'd made an error. Actually, for the first time, our organization uh, was, uh, is, it's bigger now. And we had board members who said to us, what circumstances would have you withdraw your staff from uh, you know, a place where there's violence or, or danger. And I, we'd never asked that in 15 or 20 years of working. We'd never asked that question. Someone else asked us. And that's why you have accountability structures and, and, and boards. But our main accountability, if it is to the destitute sick, I think will be a very, it's, it's the best compass that I know to avoid the, the problem that you describe. And I think if you look back at those situations that you mentioned, or that I mentioned, where things went awry, uh, that that compass was not followed unswervingly. Uh, other compasses were followed as well, or, and sometimes um, to leaving behind uh, this basic question. And also, there are, of course, situations which are just uh, dreadfully, uh, in fact, I was, I'm not going to say complex humanitarian disasters, because that gets said too much, but they're uh, terribly complicated and difficult to wade through. 
But if you could have that one compass, um, the preferential option of the poor, I think it would help us avoid um, many and maybe most of the kind of problems that you describe. Well, thank you all for um, having, having me here, and thank you for the wonderful question. So thank you, uh, Dr. Farmer, and all your associates uh, for your wisdom, your humanity, your good humor, perhaps most of all your insistent inspiration. Have a safe evening, all. Thanks, all. We're adjourned. <laughs>